Can you hear me? Okay, we're good. There you go, Molly. There you go, Emily. All right. Okay, let's get this done so we can get on out of here. Pretty much, like I said, it's it's. There's really not a whole lot. I mean, there's a whole lot to what we're talking, but the real. Let's just kind of get started. I'm going to go ahead and darken that. Wow. Now it's dark outside. This really gets dark. Okay. Start on the projector. And Ting Yi and Hal will be very pleased because I'm going to stand right here and just do the Bueller, anyone, Bueller <laughs> type thing. So we go through it. But then we'll do about three or four homework, pro about three homework problems because we're going to be talking about, as soon as it comes up, temperature and heat. Okay, or oh, temperature and kinetic theory. We'll talk about heat in chapter 11. Now, let's, let's talk, first of all, let's talk about the way this course is going to end, all right? Um, we're going to do all of chapter 10 tonight, all of chapter 11 on Thursday, and I'll give you a little bit of, um, but it's real easy stuff. And if you've had chemistry, you're going to be like, oh, wow, I've, we did this, or even ninth grade physical science, okay? Um, you'll, you'll live, I mean, it's ideal gas law, so it's, it's all pretty straightforward. And I gave you all the one-starred problems are in the textbook, so that they're just like one calculation is all you have to make for the homework. There's like seven of those. And so we'll do chapters 10, 11, and a little bit of 13. We're skipping thermodynamics because that's just too involved, and I can't do that in one class for you. That wouldn't be fair. And just a little bit of 13, because you have to see the wave equation. You have to see simple harmonic motion, or you haven't taken physics. At least that's what Howe told me. When I said we wouldn't get to harmonic motion, he said, you can't do that. So it's Howe's fault that we're going to do chapter 13. But anyway, um, so, uh, well, a little bit of it. And then your test, your last test, which will be on Tuesday night, at 5.45 here, that'll be Tuesday the 15th. A week from, two weeks from tonight will be your last test. And it's not a final, it's just exam number four. Okay? All right, and it'll be from 5.45 to 7.45, so you can um, take the test in, and we won't need to have that recorded. So they have, we have three more class periods, and we're going to cover two and a half chapters in three class periods. But they're pretty straightforward. You could combine chapters 10 and 11 together for the most part. So um, it won't be anything too crazy. And so the last test will be over the last part of chapter 9. Um, and uh, chapter 10. And um, in, in other words, the last part of chapter 9, you, you, you're going to have a Bernoulli problem on there where the change... Um, I'll just tell you that right now. You'll, you'll have um, like where you blew the penny type thing, change in pressure, find the velocity, or which way is the, what's the pressure difference, which is pretty much what you're doing. Okay, so this is temperature and kinetic theory. This is kind of a cool picture, I thought. Anyway, um, it's giving you the, uh, seeing, looking at this through infrared glasses or something, but you see the, uh, there's a little gecko in somebody's hand. He's cold-blooded, so he's the, color, he's the temperature of the room. He's not the 98 degrees or ni between 98 and 100 degrees of the human hand. And, of course, they're not quite holding the scorpion the way they're holding the gecko here. Um, and he's also cold-blooded, all right? So cold-blooded creatures, um, they take on the same temperature of whatever's outside. All right, so this is what we'll be talking about tonight, real quick. Um, Temperature and heat, uh, and the um, Celsius and Fahrenheit temperature scales, of course, gas laws, absolute temperature, which is what, chemistry people? Absolute temperature we measure in, starts with a K, Kelvins, there we go, all right, absolute temperature is in Kelvins, all right, and the tel Kelvin temperature scales, okay? And then we'll talk a little bit about thermal expansion. However, here's my first question, though. Here's my first question. This is what I did to the first class, and it drove them up. So if you could show this board over here, their camera crew. Got a question for you. If I have, so 
Something that's hot. We're talking about expansion of something. Now, Jeff might have trouble seeing this, but I think everybody else can. All right. Okay. Let's say I've got, this is like a little metal plate or something. Okay. Well, no, let's, say, let's get into Christmas season. This is a piece of gingerbread. Okay. A square piece of gingerbread. All right. And I put it in the oven. What's it going to do when it gets hot? It's going to expand. It'll, it'll actually probably have a volume expansion too because it'll rise a little bit too. But it's going to expand in all different directions. It's free to move about in all different directions. What would happen if I did this and cut a hole in it? What's going to happen to that hole? Is it going to get bigger? Is it going to stay that same size? Or is it going to shrink? Everybody says it's going to shrink. Buzz, eh, wrong. What's it going to do, Hal? Will it shrink or get bigger? It'll get bigger, right? Because he said so. That's what. All right, now, because. Oh, I got a question. Okay, so let's just take a look. Uh oh. If I could take off my wedding ring, I would, and say, all right, what if I put this? What if I put my wedding ring? In other words, it won't, I can't get it off right now. What would be one way to get it off? Put my hand under cold water because then my fingers actually shrink. It's not the ring doesn't shrink, but, it, but the ring doesn't expand, but my hand would actually shrink. Or if I heated it up, if, if, if you have a ring and you heat it up, what happens to the ring? Does it get bigger in diameter or smaller in diameter? Bigger. Same thing. Same thing here. Okay? Even though, I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, well, if it expands everywhere, it's going to smush this in. Actually, that doesn't happen because these move out. Okay? So here's the other way to look at this linear expansion thing. What it, so you, we're all agreed that if I, uh, in other words, what I can do is I can just heat it up this way, all right, and um, cut the hole out when it's heated up. And if I cool it off, it'll shrink back down to the same size as the hole was before, all right? Or that, that didn't come out very clear. Uh, uh, one way to think about it is that if I cut out the hole and heated it up, I'd be able to take that hole and put it right back in there. It's because the whole thing moves. Now, it'd be very different if, now I think some of you might be going, well, wait a minute. I've cooked little gingerbread men and their eyeballs closed on me and stuff like that. Part of that might have been because of the stickiness of the plate or the pan it was on. It wasn't allowed to move uniformly throughout and stayed in one spot so when it expanded. Because if I have tremendous force, if I apply a tremendous force here, 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 and here, and don't let this expand, then of course, if I got a hole in the middle, it'll shrink because it's got to go somewhere. It's got to expand somewhere. But since it expands uniformly, the hole actually gets bigger. Okay? So, that's always a great debate in this every semester because people are like, well, wait a minute. Um, but no, because it's able to slide out, um, it expands. All right, so that's thermal expansion. And then we'll talk about the kinetic theory of gases, which is actually um, a study of an uh, area of physics called statistical mechanics. Everybody's favorite graduate level class that they take. Okay. Actually, it's pretty hard stuff. All right, so. That's what we'll be talking about. All right, temperature. I'm going to read these to you. No, temperature is the measure of relative hotness and coldness, which that seems bizarre. I mean, that seems pretty, um, not bizarre, but that seems pretty vague or whatever. But heat, basically here's heat. Here's what, here's what I think, here's the definition of heat. Heat is basically um, the amount of, in temperature measures the amount of internal kinetic energy something has, a system has. That's pretty much what temperature is telling you. It's how much kinetic energy is involved in it. Now, what do I mean by this kinetic energy? Well, every molecule that's moved, all right, let's just look at the room here, all right, the air in the room. It is moving about. It's got these molecules that are moving about faster, pretty fast. Some of them, most of them at um, the speed of sound because they're kind of smacking into each other a little bit. They're having a perfect elastic collision. and if the temperature in the room, it feels kind of chilly, so let's say the temperature in the room is about uh, 19 degrees centigrade, so that would be about 292 absolute temperature, 292 kelvins. Um, 
then that's the amount of kinetic energy um, that is in this room. It's a way that I can measure the kinetic energy. And we will end the evening with this equation right here, where we get one half the mass of the air in the, of the molecule times V root mean square squared. That looks like a kinetic energy thing, right? That's kinetic energy. That equals that equals 3 halves Kb, which is the Boltzmann's constant, times T. So the big idea of this whole thing is if we increase the temperature of something, what do we do to its kinetic energy? <laughs> it raises. If you decrease the temperature of something, its kinetic energy goes down. All right, here's a trivia question. Some of the best parts of your book I know you all just read the book from cover to cover before you come to class. You read the whole chapter before you come in, so you're all prepared and everything. I know I did that, right? Anyway, um, well, I do it now because I have to teach the stuff. But back when I was a student, uh, they'll tell me what I need to know. Okay. And um, anyway, but some of the neat stuff in your book is actually in those little asides that they have, like the human body, to their, their little insight. Um, things that are in your book. Those are kind of fun to read and everything. Um, actually, what's the average temperature of the human body in Fahrenheit? 98.6. That's old data. New data coming in is it's about 98.2, actually, for men and women are a little bit higher, 98.4. Okay. Um, and uh, do, is your temperature higher or lower in the morning when you first wake up? Or if you're a college student in early afternoon, whatever. Lower or higher? Lower. Yeah, it's lower because your sleep, the, your body is, its kinetic energy has gone down, so your temperature is down a little bit. And plus, you're, while you were sleeping, you didn't uh, take on any food, which added energy to your system and everything else. Okay. All right. Okay. Heat is the net energy transferred from one object to another due to temperature difference, due to the amount of kinetic energy that's in, that's in either of them. I think you all, oh, this is a sad week. It's sad because tomorrow night's your last lab, isn't it? You guys aren't upset about that? <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, well, tomorrow night's your last lab. Um, and I think you're going to do a heat thing. Or have you done it already? You did it last week? Did you have that great problem where you have a piece of iron, an iron meteor smashes into the earth? And how much heat did it generate? And did it dissipate? Did it dissolve? You didn't have to answer that question? Oh, it's a great question. I might put it on the test just because it's kind of fun. But anyway, um, so in, in other words, if, if I took a small cube of ice... Okay, and I threw it down hard enough, threw it hard enough, and it smacked against the, uh, and it has enough kinetic energy that it smashes into it. This is actually getting more into chapter 11 stuff. I could throw it, get it fast enough so that it smashes in there, so all this kinetic energy turns into heat energy and it melts completely. Okay, but that's more chapter 11. I'm getting ahead of myself. All right. Temperature and heat. Okay, so here's where all the heat comes from that's internal into the thing. Every one of your little molecules in your body, or all the molecules just in, in the universe right now, started off with the Big Bang, helium and hydrogen, <laughs> sit out, very hot. Now it's cooling off and getting much more complex and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, every little molecule in your body has translational motion, linear vibration, boing, 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 like this. And it's rotating. So look at all these different kinetic energies. Here's 1 half mv squared. Here's uh, 1 half kx squared. Remember that one? Little Hooke's Law thing. And um, your rotation, your 1 half i omega squared. That kind of stuff, OK? But this is all at the quantum level, so it's a little bit different. And um, so that adds up to the total internal energy of, of a system. OK. Temperature and heat. A higher temperature does not necessarily mean that one object has more internal energy. As Dr. Ruth said, size matters. Okay. So, 
Um, in other words, if something's really big, it's got a lot more molecules moving around, so therefore it's got a lot more kinetic energy. Okay? And so when heat is transferred from one, they are said to be in thermal contact. And two objects in thermal contact without heat transfer are in thermal equilibrium. Eventually, they reach the same temperature. And you all learned that in chemistry, right? Everything's going towards absolute zero, slowing down. In fact, the universe is at what temperature, roughly? Did they teach you this? No? It's like at 4 Kelvins. So that's the average temperature. I mean, it's pretty chilly out there. We only got four more Kelvins to go, and everything stops. But that's okay. All right. It'll take a while. It'll take, it's, it's taken 13.7 billion years to get to where it is now. It'll probably take another 13.7 to get to the end. Okay. Now, temperature scales. I think one of the problems that I give you is the classic, is the classic change Fahrenheit. You, give, you get a couple of temperatures in Fahrenheit, you've got to change them to Celsius. You've been doing that since ninth grade. Okay, and if you had me for ninth grade algebra, I made you derive that formula by taking, because you take two points, like we could have a, uh, we could have a dawn temperature scale. Okay, she could say, okay, I want a temperature scale, and when water freezes, the freezing point of water is going to be 119 degrees, and when water boils, it's going to be 3,457 degrees in, on the dawn scale. Okay, and so that would be, and you would just, that would be your temperature scale, and then you'd calibrate it to the Kelvin scale and all that kind of stuff, and it, and so you can pick anything you want, just you got to have two points, uh, the freezing water and the and where it and where it um, boils, and right now, what's the freezing point Fahrenheit? Thirty-two. We're gonna get down there tomorrow night. Okay, it's gonna be chilly. All right. Um, it's probably going to be that way tomorrow morning with the wind chill. Um, and what's boiling Fahrenheit at one atmosphere? Two twelve, right? And the higher in, in Denver, it's like two oh seven because it's a little higher. It's got less atmosphere. All right, which we'll get to. Okay. And so uh, the Celsius scale is between zero and one hundred. And Kelvin's is between zero and 270, well, zero and then on up. Zero is at absolute zero, which is negative 273 degrees Celsius. So you have basically this formula right here. I'm going to write it on the board here in the dark where nobody can see it. I'll turn on the lights real quick. You got Fahrenheit, temperature in Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths Celsius plus 32. And the temperature of Celsius is equal to 5 ninths. It's just the inverse of the slope of this line. Um, times temperature of Fahrenheit minus 32 like that. Okay? All right, those are the two formulas. Now, that's like... I've been to the Mideast a couple times, been to the Far East a few times too, but um, many, spent many years in the Far East. But in the Mideast, you'd be driving past the uh, Kuwait National Bank, and their little bank sign would say the temperature was a cool, crisp 41 degrees. Okay? But that was Celsius. So, so if you did a quick, so if it's 41 degrees Celsius, the temperature Fahrenheit, basically you multiply that by 2 and add 32 to it. Bangkok was the same way. Bangkok had lovely things on their banks, you know, 38, 39 degrees. And, but multiply the 41 times 2, you get 82, add 32. So it is a balmy 114 degrees outside, roughly, or 110. That's a typical day, May through September in Kuwait, for the most part. And it gets even hotter out, of, you know, in the desert desert. Okay, so you'll have like one or two problems like that, all right, on your homework, which is pretty much just plugging it into that formula and going from there. All right. Now, one of the cool things, I wanted you to take a look. 
because, um, like I said, when you take a science class, it's supposed to be, enable you to become a better parent. All right. So when your kids ask you, how does that on the coffee maker, how does that switch automatically shut off on the coffee maker? Here's how, right here. You have one, the top part is like brass, or the bottom part is brass, and the top part up here will be some other metal, like steel or something, and they'll be alloyed together, smashed together, and the brass expands faster when it's hot than the steel or the iron on top of it. So therefore, since it expands more, but they're hooked together, it's got to be longer so it bends back. So if, you, so if it's against the hot surface, it heats up and heats up and it stretches and bends back like that and it opens up the circuit so that the heater, the heat element turns off. And then when it cools back down, it shrinks, boom, closes the circuit and turns the heat back on. Okay? So that's the way those bimetallic strips work. Okay? All right. All right, and uh, our thermometers, we usually use mercury or um, colored red dyed alcohol or red mercury um, inside the thermometers because those things expand rapidly. Okay, they expand quite a bit. And they also, the other thing they do is if we just have a regular house thermometer outside, they don't freeze. Alcohol doesn't freeze at 40 below zero like if it was red water. As soon as it got to 32 degrees, the thing would be useless because the water would freeze and it wouldn't expand anymore. But I do have a quick question. Water, when it freezes. Now, most things contract. What, what does water do? It expands. Okay, that's why, that's why it's very important. Make sure you go around your house today or, or if you've got hoses out, get the hoses in and all that kind of stuff because if on the outside of the house, if those pipes freeze, then that water expands and it backs up the pressure and it causes your pipes to break. Right? Water has that funny, has, and, and certain materials have certain ways of doing things. And so water, that's one of the things. Water. Okay, well, here's our two formulas that we have for conversion tables from Celsius to Fahrenheit. Ah, now. Let's get into the ideal gas laws. Here they are. Okay. And you've all done this before. By the way, this is pressure. If we hold the temperature constant, pressure times volume is a constant. Okay. And so the new pressure times, so if we, um, so say we've got 4 times 3 equals what? 12. All right. But let's say we up the pressure to six, what happens to my volume? It goes down to two, okay? So in other words, so P1, V1 equals P2, V2, and when the pressure is held constant, if I hold the pressure constant, and um, like if I have a balloon in this room, okay? <coughs> if I have a balloon in this room and the, and the outside uh, air pressure stays the same, if uh, V1, T1, if I increase, uh, well, that looks funny. Because I thought if I increase the temperature, I'd increase the volume. Wouldn't I? <coughs> oh, yeah. I would. I would. I would. I would. I would. So if I increase the temperature, V2 becomes T1 over T2, where T2 is, or T2 over T1, where T2 is bigger than T1. Yeah. So if I increase the temperature, this volume's got to be bigger. Duh. Sorry. So in other words, if I have uh, 6 divided by 3, and then all of a sudden this becomes 5, then this has to become 10. Yes, that works. All right, so the volume does increase. Sorry, I lost my mind there for a minute. Okay. And this is all. Um, and so when we combine all these ideas, we get the ideal gas laws. Okay, and here's at the microscopic level where N is the number of molecules that we have, okay, the number of molecules that we have, and with the Boltzmann's constant of 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin, okay, joules per Kelvin. That's to make, that's like the universal gravitational constant. Those are things to get it to come out even. And where N 
is the total number of molecules in the gas. Now I'm going to spare you all from doing the molarity calculations because I know you've all done that before. This is and I didn't give you any homework problems from that. Okay. So, and this is the macroscopic ideal gas law, which can be written as rho V equals nRT, where uh, n is the number of moles of the gas, which you all know how to convert or know how to do. You've done it in chemistry. And those of you who haven't done it in chemistry or haven't taken chemistry, don't worry about it. I didn't give us any problems off this because we're kind of flying through this material. And R is that 8.31 joules moles Kelvin and um, times T. And the T is the absolute temperature. Okay, T is in Kelvins. Right? T is in Kelvins. Because one of the problems that you run into if you don't use Kelvins, what if we're trying to find, what if we're trying to find what the volume is? We know the pressure, we know N, we know R, because these guys are kind of, or we figure out what, how, how much stuff we have, and we know R because that's a constant, and they say T is zero centigrade. It means I have no volume, or whatever. Can't do that, all right? So, we use Kelvins. Okay, now then. A constant volume gas thermometer is useful because the temperature is directly proportional to the pressure. You've probably all seen these, these PT curves, okay? They're plotted. Now, the curious thing happens down here. In this area, notice this is coming down nice linear relationship. In other words, as the temperature goes up, what happens to the pressure? It goes up. As long as we keep constant volume, as long as the volume is constant, if the pressure goes up, or if the temperature goes, as the temperature goes up, where's my arrow? It's gone. There it is. As the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up. But notice as the temperature comes back down, coming here, it's a nice, then all of a sudden it starts to fall off. What's happening here? As these things, notice here, nice even thing, then all of a sudden it whoosh, falls off here. What's going on here? Do you think? What's happened to that material? It's done what? Yeah, it froze. It's turned into a solid. And so then all bets are off. We're not dealing with gases anymore. Okay? <laughs> it's no longer an ideal gas law, all right? Because it's a solid. Or it's a liquid. It's mainly turned into a liquid. All right, and that's, what, that's basically what all we're going to do in chapter 11. In the next chapter on Thursday night is we're going to talk about the different, we're going to talk about um, the uh, latent heat of fusion and the, uh, um, gosh, I can't even remember what it's called now, where Q equals CMT. You've all done that? Where you've got the specific heat stuff, right? Specific heat, the latent heat. Uh, Heat of fusion and the different states that things go through and how much energy you have to add or how much energy is going to detract. Or if I throw a big frozen watermelon into a pool of water, what's the temperature going to be when it reaches equilibrium? That kind of stuff. Okay. All, th all things you've done in chemistry, I'm sure, but we'll, we'll just, we got to do it one more time. All right, so here's my degrees Kelvin, which we've already talked about. Okay, and here's the Kelvin scale and <laughs> Kelvin scale, Fahrenheit scale. Woohoo! That is chilly. Minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. Now on the other side, Fahrenheit 451, 451 degrees Fahrenheit. Y'all ever read that book? What does that mean? Isn't it the temperature where books burn? Yes. Yeah, that's the temperature where books burn. It's Fahrenheit 451. It's kind of All right, now we've got thermal expansion. Is that it? Is that all there is to that? Yeah, I told you this is pretty easy stuff until we get to the kinetic stuff. Now, thermal expansion. All I'm going to give you is good old linear thermal expansion. And we're going to do one of the, and, uh, I'm going to kind of get through the slides here. And um, 
Then we'll do like three homework problems and we'll be done for the evening. All right, but anyway, linear expansion. Here you go. This alpha, the, the change in the length, this delta L right here, is equal to the change in temperature. All right, because if I just brought this over, I get TO minus T naught equals delta T. All right, and this is what is known as your expansion coefficient. All right, and that'll be given to you. I don't know, maybe in your lab, you guys are going to find the expansion coefficients of some materials. Is that what you're doing? I think in this new lab this week. Oh, you've already did it last week. Oh, you found the expansion coefficients of materials? Oh, cool. So we're almost on par with the labs, not quite. OK. Well, this is what you're doing. You're finding the expansion coefficients because you were able to measure this, you are able to measure this, and you are able to measure this, supposedly, right? So if you take delta uh, the change divided by L divided by delta T, you should get alpha, right, for a certain material. OK. And it's pretty straightforward. I mean, that, there's, that's all, pretty much all there is to it. Delta, the change in the length is equal to the coefficient times the original length times its change in temperature. And, it, and for the most part, the change in temperature, you can use Celsius or Kelvin. It doesn't make any difference. Because the change between uh, 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 20 degrees Fahrenheit is 20. And, the, and on the Kelvin scale, it would be the same change. It would just be 313 minus 30293. So it would be the same thing. All right. And we're not going to do um, area or volume. So here's different things have different lengths. So if you notice, you notice here, if I have a brass thing, or if I have an aluminum and brass piece fused together, this one has a much larger coefficient of expansion, okay? And so coefficient of linear expansion. So um, if I fuse these two materials together, since this one has a larger one, um, is this one going to bend more or less under the same temperature? What's it going to do? Bend more, right, because alpha times the original length times delta T times the same temperature, it's going to bend more. So we would want to have the brass, in other words, I'd want to have the aluminum, then the brass like this on my bimetallic, if the heat was down here, if the heat source is here. And then my aluminum would cause it to bend like that. Okay. All right. Because you can see right here where ice is pretty bad. I mean, it's twice as much as that one. It kind of melts pretty quick. All right. Okay, now, let's get into the kinetic theory of gases. All right. Now, remember what we did, what we learned back in chapter one of them, five, I think it was, where if something smacks into something and changes direction, it experiences a force. It creates a force there, which is basically it's change in momentum right here over change in time. That's the force. So you got all this m momentum going on here with these little um, molecules. And they're perfectly elastic collisions. This is when we have perfect elastic collisions, OK? And this is the whole area of stat mech. So when we get into these kinetic theory of uh, gases, we pretty much tell you, Here's the formula. We're not going to derive it. I think Appendix 3 does, and I looked at it, and I went, eh, we don't need to do that in the evening. So um, we just need to get what the big idea is. All right? So anyway, we started off the evening. We said, OK, well, pressure times the volume is equal to some constant, which equals 1 third. Oh, that's a new thing. Number of molecules times m times VRMS. Now, the VRMS squared is basically the mass and speed are those of an individual molecule, all right? And so what we do is we take all those molecules and we take the average speed of them, square it, take the square root of that, 
And that gives us the root mean square. That's what RMS stands for. Okay. RMS stands for the root mean square of the thing. All right. And here we go. This is StatMac boiled down to a 10 second sentence. All right. Here it is. One half MV squared of the root mean squared is equal to three halves times that Boltzmann's constant, which is that 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin times the temperature. So, and this has always bugged me, being an old, old timey algebra teacher, I'm always like, why don't we just get rid of the twos? Why don't we just say MV squared equals three times? But we don't. Um, for, because we want to say, ah, this is kinetic energy equals this energy right here. So, what happens to my kinetic energy if I double my temperature? It will double. Okay, my kinetic energy will double. However, my velocity won't double necessarily. Okay, my velocity is not going to double. All right, just if I double the temperature because it's squared in there. But the total kinetic energy of the system will double. All right, so we've got one half mv squared equals three halves kBT. And that, my friends, is the end of chapter 10 for the most part. So let's look at three of your problems before you, I send you out into the dark, dark night here. Okay, so we'll turn off the projector. And turn this on. Raise the dealy. Hope y'all had a good Thanksgiving. Y'all were pretty good. I didn't get any emails from anyone in this class. So that was good. All right. So let's take a look at what some of your problems are. Uh, I know I gave you uh, problem six, I'm pretty sure. And I might have given you problem two also. But problem six is the highest and lowest recorded air temperatures in the world are respectively 58 degrees Celsius, 58 Celsius, we don't say degrees anymore for any measurement, um, in Libya in 1922, and minus 89 degrees Celsius. Uh, in Antarctica. What are those temperatures on the Fahrenheit scale? Well, how hard is that? You're going to use this. Okay. Basically, you're going to convert, you're going to take those things, multiply them by 9 fifths, and add 32. Ta da! You're done. Like that good old. Oh, by the way, what is. This might be a good qu test question. Would be just to throw it out there. Derive where the two formulas are, e where the two temperatures are equal. Where are they equal? Where do they have the same number? You just set those two guys equal to each other, <coughs> and it comes out to be what? Well, you can figure it out, or you can go online and you can Google that one. When it, when is Fahrenheit and Celsius, the same number. At what temperature? Okay. And then, I gave you another problem that says this. I gave you 26 and 28. Now, because I wanted to give you 29, or, or, yeah, I wanted to give you 28 and 29, but for some reason, 29 wasn't available for in mastering physics, but 26 was. It says, uh, uh, and I don't want to do 26, I'm going to do 28. It says on a warm day, 92 degrees Fahrenheit, on a warm day, so the temperature in Fahrenheit equals 92 degrees. Uh, an air-filled balloon occupies a volume of 0.2 V1 equals 0 0.200 meters cubed. This is problem 28. Right? And it says this. It has a pressure 
of 20 pounds, 20 pounds per inch squared. 20 pounds per inch squared. Okay, now then, what I'm going to do is, um, if the balloon is cooled in a refrigerator at the temperature of the refrigerator, uh, so this is T1, T2 equals 32 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And volume two, I don't know, but it's under new pressure inside the refrigerator at 14 pounds. So the pressure we, per inch squared. Now, the nice thing is, when I first looked at this problem, I was like, oh my, we're gonna have to do conversions and conversions because we're gonna have to get that 20 pounds per inches into Pascals, but we don't have to. You know why? Yeah, because the units will cancel. The units will cancel. However, you can't do it with these two guys. You gotta convert this to, to Kelvins, okay? Because of that adding 32 thing here with the Celsius and all this, we have to convert it to Celsius because you got this fact, this little guy right here that kind of keeps it from being a complete linear relationship, all right? So, you gotta convert those guys to Kelvins, which isn't hard to do. Um, you take 92, multiply it by 5 ninths, and subtract 32, whatever that comes out to be. But anyway, here's what happens. So, convert to, so to do the problem, convert this to Kelvins. And to find the new volume, you know this. You know that P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. And... Wow. So V2 then equals P1, V1, T2 over T1 over P2. There you go. This, these are not, I, I don't, I don't think it'll work out if you don't convert it to Kelvins. I don't think you'll get the right answer. I think you, you have to convert it. How saying yeah, you have to, so we're gonna go with that. Do you have to convert the pressures? No, that, that's kind of, because it's a nice ratio. It's a perfect ratio. This thing, see this, this minus 32 thing here, right here, when we're converting from Celsius to Fahrenheit, that throws off our nice little ratio, okay? In other words, the numerator get all screwed up because of that. So you have to convert to Kelvins to get it to work. Okay, and then, so there's two of the problems that I, of the seven that I assigned. And problem 26 is just the same thing. It's just a shrinking of the volume again. You're gonna have to do a conversion where the volume is 3.5 liters. Well, well, if you're, if you're answer, by how much has the volume dec decreased? Be careful with those, because some of you had problems. Um, you weren't the only one. You had a problem with that one, that one problem where you had the blood and the aorta flowing through, and you got the wrong, and you, and you figured out that its new velocity was like 4.41 meters per second. And you're like, why is it this not right? It's because you had to take the difference. So the same thing on 26. You're going to want to find the difference in the volume. So you're going to find V2, and you're going to do V2 minus V1 will give you your correct answer. Okay? It's part of reading the problems. Now, last but not least, wow. I think it's because I rehearse with the 230 class or something. I go through it too quick. All right. Well, anyway, the last problem, I assigned you, I think, 56 and 57. And let's take a look. Um, okay. It says, what, at problem 56, it says, what is the RMS speed of the molecules in a low density oxygen gas at zero degrees Celsius? And the mass of an oxygen molecule is five point of 
5.31 times 10 to the negative 26, ouch, 26, can't even play that one off. 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. So, we're going to use this guy. But it's at 0 degrees Celsius, which equals 273 uh, Kelvins. I know better than to say degrees Kelvin. You know, I can't help myself. I always have to, anyway, just to make chemistry people upset. But anyway, 273 Kelvins. And uh, the mass is equal to 5.31 times 10 to the negative 31 kilogram, 26 kilograms. And KB is equal to 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per kilogram. Wow. Oh, joules per Kelvin. Not joules per kilogram. That's the stupidest thing. There we go. Joules per Kelvin. Now, that makes more sense. Hey, I think we've got everything we need. So, one half m VRMS, root mean squared, is equal to three halves. 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin. I think that's right. Isn't that 10 to the negative 23 or is it 10 to the negative 27? You may remember. Got to remember? 23. I thought so. All right. Cancel out the twos. So VRMS is equal to... Um, 6 times uh, 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin. Oh, I forgot to put my Kelvins here. Times uh, 273. Aha! There. Kelvins cancel. I'm left with joules. That works. This will be joules over here. And take the square root of that. Divide it by, just a minute, we got to divide it by the mass. Divide it by 5.31 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. Make sure you get that guy in there, too. Ta-da! That gives you your VRMS. All right, and then... Problem 27 asks you, do you think you could figure out what's the average kinetic energy per molecule of a monatomic gas at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius? What would you use? Right here. Here you go. That gives you your energy per molecule. That gives you your kinetic energy per molecule right there. And then it goes on to ask, what is the IMS speed of the molecules that the gas is helium? In other words, helium is light, 6.65 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So you just, you'd figure out what that is. You'd figure out your K, this is your kinetic energy, your average kinetic energy, which you have. And then you take your mass. And so VRMS, as always, looks like 2KE. We've used this guy before, divided by M. Take the square root of that. There you go. See, those, this homework assignment was easy. It was easy. And, and so will the test questions. I think I owe you kind of an easy test as the last one. It was kind of brutal. Some people did fine. Some people did fine. Some people were like, yeah, was, I thought test three was easier than test one. But no, no. I didn't think so. You see the makeup that I made for the for the video class. Oh, video class people. Where do you see your test on Thursday? It's all right. It's only worth 5% of your grade. I don't, I don't even, should make it worth 50. No. All right. Or back in Europe. You know how they do school in Europe? 
college, you pretty much take a final. That's it. They, you, you go to class and you, they say, well, here's the homework problems and you do them and then you just go in and take a final. See if you learned anything. So, anyway. That's old school. So, all right. Um, that's, that's the way they used to do college here too and that's back when C's, straight C's and B's would get you into medical school. All right, but that kind of went away. All right. Um, I think there's a direct co correlation between the GI Bill and great inflation. But anyway, um, so, but the GI Bill is still a good piece of legislation. All right, well, that's about it. That's about it. All right. Uh,